Reports are circulating on social media that the World Health Organization put out a report saying that there is a causal relationship between the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine and multiple sclerosis. But in fact, this wasn't a World Health Organization report at all. So this is misinformation. Let's talk about it. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. David. Hope you're having a great day today. Um, before I get into the meat of this conversation, I just want to, um, again, reiterate what my take on COVID vaccine and COVID and vaccines overall have been um, really throughout my career, but it's in particular to this. Now, I have always been an open minded individual looking at different sides of a particular argument and weighing the pros and cons and providing information, reporting to the best of my knowledge at that particular time. And of course, I have my, my thoughts will change as they evolve, as I get more information, but I'm also not very easily influenced by the government, by drug companies, by commercials or anything else. I'm an independent thinker and I come up with my own conclusions. Okay. Now, um, over time, as I said, my thoughts have evolved on this, and certainly, as I've talked about in many videos before, as the vi virus has evolved and the vaccines kind of didn't, kind of did, um, again, we are in a different situation right now. So I realize that many people are not going out and getting COVID vaccines or considering at this point, but still, this is a report that came through that was on social media, so I thought it would be important for us to talk about it. Now, as far as this story itself, and I'm going to put up a, um, a screenshot of this so you can see what I'm talking about, but um, that circulating on social media, um, the World Health Organization reported that there was a relationship between the COVID mRNA vaccine and multiple sclerosis. And um, people were referring to, the paper that we're actually referring to was, refer, was called COVID-19 vaccination can induce multiple sclerosis via cross-reactive CD4 plus T-cell recognizing SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and myelin peptides. This rolls right off of the tongue there. But, but here's the thing, if you look at this, um, you know, which is something that I first learned about it myself from Dr. John Campbell. Now, Dr. Campbell, as you may know, has been somebody that I've advocated. I've shared my, my thoughts before, talked to my patients about all the time and really is one of the best independent reporters, um, that are out there, but you'll see here that what he did on his video, and I, I put the video, the link into the uh, comment, into the notes down below the description, so you can see what it is that I'm referring to. Um, but he was saying that this was something that was put out by the World Health Organization, and as you can see, that's actually not what it is. Um, the World Health Organization, as you can see, this is reporting a database. The World Health Organization COVID-19 Research Database, and this is all the medical papers that one can find on COVID, okay? Now, one can search it. It doesn't mean that they, that they endorse this. It doesn't mean that they agree with the findings. It's just a paper that they put forth. And as you can see, it's not by them at all. Um, now, so I, I appreciate him so much, but I also feel when we're giving more, when more information is provided that doesn't even really explain what this is. It kind of get things can get lost and people can get confused. And I so I really just want to make sure that there is no confusion. The World Health Organization did not endorse this, did not um, did not say that this these findings are correct. Just it's in their database. OK, now in the video, um, his videos um, specifically said um, and talked about how the researchers described and so this is one of the things dr campbell does he describes things wonderfully explains about medical research and the papers in a way that most people can understand because if you've ever looked at a medical paper it can get pretty technical and it can be very easy to either get lost or really have no idea what they're talking about because of statistics and scientific terms so this is his specialty he's wonderful at doing this now what he showed in, in, in as part of his presentation was how in multiple sclerosis the myelin sheath. Now, the myelin is the insulator. It helps the signal propagate in the nerves that are in the brain, as well as in the spinal cord. A properly functioning myelin sheath is essential for proper neurological function. And in multiple sclerosis, there are these autoimmune antibodies that attack the myelin sheath. It disrupts the integrity of the myelin, which therefore makes the nerve 
propagation, the nerve signals, not be able to function in a proper way. And that's why people can get all of the types of symptoms, mostly neurological, from multiple sclerosis. Okay. Now, as far as um, what he did find, um, you know, he then went on actually and started explaining about how the T cells can be activated by, uh, and specifically to the spike protein antibodies, how they're naturally stimulated to cause multiple sclerosis and how there could be some cross reactivity between the spike protein antibody that would make it similar to an MS antibody that then attacks the myelin, which causes the disruption. Okay. Now, the um, World Health Organization, as I said, it didn't report that there was this actual um, connection here. And in fact, as you can see from what I showed before, it was actually in a journal called Multiple Sclerosis Journal. And it was actually um, um, the, the 28 um, and the third supplement of it. So it was one of the volumes there. Now, the journal website itself, because I went looking for it, and it, it doesn't mention, even you can see here on, the, on what I showed before, it doesn't mention any of the um, authors. Um, and when I searched for this, I couldn't find it on their website, which is really kind of weird. You would think that a, um, a journal that is published by a journal, like a paper, I should say, would show up on the website. And I don't know why it was. I can't figure out whether that this was something that was pulled, somebody edited it out, it's being censured. I do not know. But that is kind of concerning that I can't find this paper that Dr. Um, that Dr. Campbell is referring to. So in addition, in the if you click on his video, you will actually see his interpretation. And he actually cuts and pastes the text of the paper itself. So you can see what it is that he's talking about and what he's referencing there. So that's the best I can do. I I can't give you a direct link to the paper itself. Now, um, in this particular paper that he reported on, there were two cases of people who developed multiple sclerosis soon after getting a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. And what they, again, what they said is they actually reported on the spike protein specific T cells, both found in the peripheral blood as well as in the spinal cord, in the spinal fluid. They actually did spinal taps on these patients, which is not uncommon in a patient who has new onset neurological symptoms and you're thinking about multiple sclerosis, okay? But when I read through this, there was a couple of things that really didn't get covered in this paper or in Dr. Campbell's um, interpretation. First of all, there was no mention as to whether these individuals had actually had COVID before. OK, and there, there is a way that one can obviously test it if they if they're symptomatic and they obviously have a positive test, positive swab. That's one way. And of course, and as Dr. Um, Campbell has talked about many times as have I, there's the anti nucleocapsid antibody that only shows up with a vi the virus, the wild virus, but not from the vaccine. But this wasn't reported. So first of all, we don't know if these individuals had the virus itself first. OK, we know they got the vaccine. But, you know, in terms of the immune system, the immune system reacts every time that you're exposed to something, including spike protein, including bee stings or any other kind of allergies. And often it's not the first time, but the second time that there's an exposure or third time that the reaction is stronger because there's memory cells and the white blood cells and the antibodies jump into action. So we don't know if there was first a viral infection and that this could be like a multi-hit phenomenon that caused this. OK, and of course, just because the spike protein antibodies are there, that's not proof itself that it caused the multiple sclerosis. Now, um, of course, that would have been good information to know if you're reporting that in the first place. But we can only go with the information that we have. So what was presented in the paper, though, it is biologically plausible. There's nothing that I see that says that this type of reaction, this cross reactivity cannot happen. That happens many times with lots of viruses. Epstein-Barr virus um, can be attacking things. Antibodies against strep throat can attack people's joints, can attack their brains. Panda is an example. Rheum um, um, rheumatic fever can cause those types of things, attacking the kidneys, all types of things. So we know infections can cause that. We know that vaccines can induce Guillain-Barre syndrome, another autoimmune condition that affects the um, nerves that makes can make a person be paralyzed. So there are totally examples of both viruses as well as vaccines that can cause this type of phenomenon. So of course, I'd have to say it's biologically plausible that this happened. Now, 
I also wanted, you know, figured I'd dig a little bit more. It had been a little bit wh- a while since I'd looked at any of the COVID autoimmunity um, literature. So I decided I would see if there was anything else new there. And I did find another paper from, and it was a 2023 peer reviewed article, although it was a small paper in terms of the number of participants. But I do want to talk about it because I think it's important to get all of the information so that people can continue to make the best decisions with as much information as possible. So in this other paper, and I'm read the name of it as well, was called New Onset Multiple Sclerosis Post-COVID-19 Vaccination and Correlation with Possible Predictors in a Case-Controlled Study. Okay, again, lots of words. There were two groups. One of them had 32 people. One of them had 35 people. The 32 of them were people who had multiple sclerosis that were diagnosed after having a COVID vaccine. The other half of the people were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis but did not get the vaccine. I'm sorry, I said that wrong, that there were people who received the vaccine but did not develop multiple sclerosis. So those were the two people who they were comparing. And the reporting of the followings, they found that there were actually certain risk factors that were associated with the people who developed multiple sclerosis after the vaccines. And those were, in particular, the Pfizer vaccine. So maybe it wasn't all messenger va- RNA vaccines, but it was the Pfizer, not, not the, um, the Moderna. Low serum vitamin D levels. Hello. Hi, everybody. We been a while since I've talked about vitamin D. Makes perfect sense. Low vitamin D is associated with abnormal hyperreactions of the immune system, also for lower immunity and and and, uh, and getting sick and allergies as well. But low, I mean, we talked about how severe um, COVID is more likely to happen in the wild state when a person has a low vitamin D. So not shocking at all. They also found that it was more likely to happen in people who had a previous blood documentation of mono, Epstein-Barr virus, and also in people who had a family history of multiple sclerosis. Okay, now, the biggest challenge that I have with this, although it was peer-reviewed, I mean, it it was done properly, but, you know, when there's only 65 people, there's certainly um, room to, um, for some error there, and of course, I would like to see a larger study. You would think that this would be kind of an easy study to replicate. It's unfortunate that those kind of things don't get done, obviously. The drug companies aren't going to do it. It doesn't seem as if the government has much of a... um, Desire to do that as well, but certainly something that's there. So overall, what is my conclusion here? Okay, first of all, just flat out, it's false information to say that the World Health Organization endorsed or reported that there is a relationship between COVID vaccine, messenger RNA vaccine, and multiple sclerosis. But also, we've, you know, the paper did show that there could be a connection. Okay, it certainly could be a connection based upon the information. It certainly hasn't been ruled out. Okay, so because of this, it's just more information for us to kind of put into our memory bank and to really come back to why do some people have negative reactions much more severe, whether it's to viruses or whether it's to a vaccine. And again, vitamin D. I didn't mention zinc today. Let me put my zinc, uh, my zinc out there as well. But also, you know, we've talked all along about our immune support protocol, the things that we start to do, high dose vitamin A, arabinogalactan or echinacea, higher doses of vitamin C, et cetera, to take on the first signs of illness, which is something that we recommend people do before and after vaccines as well. So it's kind of a catch all, if you will. So anyways, hope you have more information that you didn't have before. Have a great day. Thank you.